Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about religion today. Um, yeah, and and what I'm going to first of all talk just a little bit about people who weren't born uh, into uh, the Catholic Church. The vast majority of the population of France at the time, in the course uh, until um, till say 1960, um, were born uh, Catholic. Now, whether they practice their religion is something we'll come to. Uh, in a minute. Um, of the percentage of the population of France who are Protestants, um, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, is about 5%. The number of Jews, I think Chip Sarwine tells you in his book, but I think it's about 300,000. Now first let me tell you where Protestants and Jews were for the most part and why, just to give you a sense of all this. Um, the, the, the Reformation, in the 16th century, uh, when it sort of the Calvinism expands from, from Geneva, um, where Jean Calvin uh, had considerable influence, uh, it spread really down, uh, down the Rhone River, uh, and it, it conquered large parts, or found adepts in large parts of this part of France, including Lyon. Lyon was conquered back by the Catholic Church as they would uh, uh, consider it the, the Catholic Reformation, or it used to be called the Counter-Reformation, but you don't call it that anymore. Um, but yet there were large sections of the south of France that remained Protestant and that still are. Just in case it ever pops up in a crossword puzzle, uh, the department with the largest number of Protestants, uh, something of like a third, it's about what it was in the, uh, in the uh, 19th century, is the Gard, a G-A-R-D, uh, that you would, uh, I've, that's where Nîmes is the capital of it. Um, and the second is the Ardèche, uh, A-R-D-E-C-H-E, -E, uh, which is where we hang out. Um, there are also still, and were, Protestants uh, in the va river valleys coming down to the Rhone, particularly in the department of the Drôme. I mean, you don't have to remember all this information. Lots of Protestants in Lorraine and in Alsace, and of course, that has been amputated in the next to Germany. And you know, Protestants sort of here and there, lots of Protestants, uh, when the Edict of Nantes, that is, that gave toleration to Protestantism, is revoked by Louis XIV um, uh, in 1685, uh, lots of people tried to get out. Uh, lots of Huguenots, as they were called, uh, went to Amsterdam, to the Pays Bas, to the Netherlands, uh, and lots tried to go to um, Quebec in Canada because it would be, they thought it would be easier to practice their religion there, but many of them couldn't afford the passage and end up living here in the Charente, so they're in the Charente Maritime, in this area here, the Charente. So you, uh, that's the beautiful city, France's most beautiful city on the coast outside of Collioure, uh, La Rochelle, uh, the capital of the Charente Maritime. Um, and then you have Protestants, of course, in, in Paris and in some of the large uh, cities. Uh, what happens is after the annexation of, of Alsace and much of Lorraine by uh, by the German Empire, uh, many of the Protestants in, in Al Alsace and some in Lorraine moved. Uh, many moved to, to Belfort, uh, which w became a territory because of their, uh, not a department, because of the heroic defense of Belfort by a general during the Franco-Prussian War. So there are your, your main um, centers of Protestantism. Now what about Jews uh, who get rights during the French Revolution. The first synagogue uh, in France, which is you know, routinely targeted by you know, vicious graffiti and this sort of thing, uh, is in the Vaucluse, that is the Département of Avignon, a place called Car Carpentras or Carpentras. You can see either, say either word Tras usually, and Carpentras usually on the other side uh, uh, of the Rhone. Uh, you have large concentrations of Jews, Sephardic Jews in Bordeaux, uh, and in Paris, and in Alsace, and Lorraine, where there had been really vigorous and vicious anti-Semitic riots uh, after the revolution of 1848. And in Alsace, interestingly enough, the three religions, that is the Catholics, the Protestants, and the Jews, tried to outdo each other in charity. They set up really remarkable kind of voluntary associations to help out poor people. Um, and uh, you know, it's sort of one interesting sort of aspect of it. So that's just a sort of overview. But the vast majority of the population were born into the Catholic Church. Now, because of the role of the Church in the counter-revolution of the Great French Revolution, and because of the close attachment of the Catholic Church 
to monarch to to to, to uh, the monarch to the monarchy that is support for the ill-fated Comte de Chambord, Henry V, and all of that. You have this tension uh, between the Catholic Church as a public institution and uh, uh, an increasingly powerful state. Now, one differentiation that you should make uh, is. Uh, between de-Christianization, which I'm going to talk about, and anti-clericalism. Now, uh, Voltaire, the great philosopher, he once said, crush the awful thing. And he didn't mean religion itself. What he meant was the public institutional role of the Catholic Church. And he was, became the ultimate sort of symbol of of anti-clericalism. Anti-clericalism wasn't necessarily anti-religiosity. What it was, was was against the public role, institutional role of the Catholic Church in politics. Thus, in French cities in the, 18, I mean the 1880s, 1890s, uh, there are literally battles over urban space where Lay, lay aside, secularized, and anti-clerical municipalities want to refuse the rights of, uh, or the right of ca the Catholic Church to stage processions of relics, for example, on, on feast days. In Limoges, which became La Ville Rouge, uh, you know, a red, the red city, uh, it had once been a very religious town, but they still had this, every seven years they still do these processions where they haul state re uh, saints' relics through the streets. And so the municipality said, no, you can't do that because that is violating the neutrality of public space. And so thus you have this big bagarre, you got this big brawl between a church and, you know, laicizing, secularizing municipalities influenced by, by socialism. Uh, not necessarily against religion, but against the public role of, of the Catholic Church. And so that's kind of you know, a background you know, for all of that. Now, it used to be, maybe 80 years ago, no, less than that, maybe 50 years ago, that um, one of the, 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 the interpretations of the French Revolution the impact of the French Revolution and the empire, the first empire, that is N1, Napoleon I, who made peace with the church, was that it was the revolution that destroyed that old-time religion. And in 1815, when Louis XVIII, before this course cranks up, comes back, um, he, he espouses the view that, 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 that church people had that the revolution uh, had been created by people like Rousseau and Voltaire, and that they had been responsible for moving France away from that old-time religion. And as I said the other day, after 1815, there was a revival of, of intense religiosity in some regions. You find the same thing in, uh, uh, in the 1870s, again, the Republic of the Moral Order. And so that's what the church wanted people to believe, and many historians believe that as well. But along came a historian called Michel Vauvel, V-O-V-E-L-L-E. -E. He used to be the professor of the French Revolution in Sorbonne, and he's kind of a friend of mine, or at least a good acquaintance, a very old dude now. Um, and Vauvel was interested to see whether that old-time religion was uh, already crumbling or in decline before the French Revolution. And so he started out asking just how effective was the Counter-Reformation or the Catholic Reformation, if you will, in bringing back, reviving that Baroque piety of a religion of faith, of religion in paintings of swooning cupids, of intense religious belief. And what he discovered was that in the parts of France that he looked at, that that old-time religion was already waning. And thus we come to the concept, which is important for this course, and just in uh, general, of de-Christianization. And de-Christianization means two things. First, again, before this course, it meant 
the campaign against the church as a public institution and really against organized religion undertaken by, uh, during the terror by Robespierre and the others. It meant melting down church bells. It, me it meant meaning that, that only priests who swore allegiance to the French Revolution, to the nation, could say mass and pretty soon putting them under pressure not to say mass at all. But that's not what we're talking about. The residual, the remnants of that are still important in the period we're, we're discussing. But what Vauvel, whose name I should write on the board, uh, in a book called Broke Piety and Dechristianization, which is uh, look, looking at part of, uh, of uh, Provence, started with that, what he uh, meant was that decline in religious practice. Now, it's very hard, I mean, for, you know, imagine you know, you're in the story, and that's what you are in this course. How are you going to prove whether religion has, that, has still an important role in the individual person or in family life or in public life if you're looking a long time ago? How are you going to know that? in a society in which, in the, in the 18th century, uh, the majority of people could not read and write, and in which the only uh, things about religion that you could read were reports b uh, written by, or sermons written by, published by bishops and archbishops, uh, or reports sent by those delegates of bishops and archbishops going around France are going around their, their diocese to see how many, uh, you know, what the state of religion was. How do you do that? How do you know what, you know, whether people went to church or not? H how do you know that? And so what he did was the following. Th and this was, talk about tough work, uh, that there are ways of doing this. Uh, let me just give you a couple. Uh, for example, I don't know how many, uh, some of you raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I was once thrown out of a religion class and paddled in a, a Jesuit high school in Portland, Oregon, uh, because uh, the guy had messed up the Thomas Aquinas' pr uh, proofs of the existence of God, and I thought I you know, thought I was a smart ass. I could prove that God couldn't exist by what he'd done, and so they I, they threw me out of religion class. Uh, uh, but you know, so I don't know if that would be a statistic in in, in, in this kind of evolution. But basically, what uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, babies ha have had to be I don't know if it's still the case, but had to be baptized. Uh, within the first three days of birth. Just thus all these, these certificates that have, remember the, the Acte de Temoinage, where people say, I, I see this baby, the baby is alive. And they baptize the baby, so if the baby dies, and remember babies died all the time uh, after childbirth, if you made it to one, year one, you had a good chance of living to the ripe old age of 40. Uh, uh, that, that you know, if you didn't baptize the baby, the baby died, then the baby you know, uh, was going to go to limbo or something and sort of float around. I, you know, there were all these, these popular uh, beliefs about, uh, about limbo. And so what he did is he went out and he looked at all these baptisms, certificates of baptism, thousands of them, to see how long it was that, you know, how long did people, after the birth, did they baptize their children? And now people had already started thinking about that. The first religious sociologists were priests at the end of the 19th century who said, people don't go to church anymore. Why not? And so they, they went out and they began to, in fact, one of the people, who, people whose work I most admire is an old, very old, he must be 110, no, literally 90, a priest in Limoges who used to go out and look in the cemeteries to see what people r had written on tombs. And he looked at, at the names that people named babies. More about that in a minute. So what Vauvel found and what subsequent historians of religion have found are, are that you know, the curve goes something like this, you know, three days to you know, a, a month to two months to six months, and in the 19th century, increasingly in parts of France, that's key, never. Um, and then there are other things you could do. When people of means died, they left wills. In, in the 1830s in Paris, 75% of the population left nothing to nobody because they had nothing to leave anybody and they couldn't afford to have anybody drop a will. They couldn't afford a lawyer or a notary to draw up a will. So what Vauvel found was that, that where people had, you know, had er in earlier times at the height of the Counter-Reformation or the Catholic Reformation in the 17th century, they had left money to have masses said for their souls or they had left money to Catholic institutions caring for lepers or caring for other sick people uh, or foundling homes 
And increasingly, they stopped doing that in the areas that he looked at. And they started leaving money to lay associations or to somebody else. You know, to their uncle or their children. Uh, you know, no longer th you know, 150 masses said, <coughs> said on their anniversary or their birthday for the repose of their mortal soul. And then you can look at religious vocations. Uh, there are parts of France that have always had a lot of priests. Um, uh, Finisterre, uh, uh, Brittany, uh, for one example. But so you could look, and what he discovered was that the number of people going into the clergy, men and women, declined rapidly in the parts of Provence that he looked at. Now that's a good sign. What about names? There's another one. I mean, this is talk about boring work, but this is what this guy, Noel Limoges, did. Um, you can, when people start naming their babies, when they stop naming them after saints, that tells you something. For example, in the Limousin, this is an example, but in the Limousin, you know, the, the saints that were big time saints there, one is a Leonard, like Leonard, and another was a Martial, the name Martial. And so this guy uh, looked, and, and people stopped naming their children Martial and Leonard, Leonard. And, and, and that, you know, that tells you something too. Or, I mean, a more obvious one would be women's names. Uh, you may, but you probably don't know people named Mary Magdalene. Uh, and, it, and, and during the French Revolution, a lot of people took the old Roman names and they started naming their babies th things like Gracchus and names like that. But you can look, uh, you don't know anybody named Gracchus, I bet, but you can, uh, you know, this was another way that, that you could do it. And there's other re ways too. Remember I said that one of the published sources you can actually read uh, are these bishop sermons because they were published every year. And when these bishop sermons, and now I'm talking more about the 19th century, when they tar start talking about the dark secrets, what are the dark secrets at a time of, of plunging birth rate? Birth control. Birth control. And that tells you something away, very indirectly as well. And what about even going to Mass? In the Catholic Church, you're supposed to go to Mass on Sundays, and you're certainly supposed to go to Mass and confession uh, on Easter, at Easter time. And so that's one of the things they had the priests count up. They would count people and, and, uh, who were in the church. And what you had is, again, an astonishing decline of the number of people going to church. Just an aside, because I worked with a sociologist, and the first thing I, I didn't have a job one year, first year after I finished my degree you know, at Michigan, Mighty Michigan, Maize and Blue Forever, uh, uh, I taught sociology. Uh, and uh, so I was used to counting things, you know. I worked with a great sociologist called Charles Tilley. And so one day, because uh, I was writing a book about our village, and uh, with my daughter uh, then, who was about 11, I, we heard the bells ring there's the, uh, for church, and there's only a mass about every six weeks. More about that later. And I said, well, let's go up and count the number of people in church. So, a and there's a huge gap between men and women in a church attendance. It was true in the 19th century, and it's true now. So we go to the back of this church, and we <laughs> start counting the number of people. And there were 18 people. And my daughter, then 11, all of a sudden said, Mais papa, même les femmes sont chauves. Even the, even the women are bald. And of course, then everybody in the church turned around and looked at us standing in the back. Uh, and she had a, you know, a cruel point there. She didn't mean it to be cruel, but it was that most of the people who went to church were very old ladies. Uh, but the priest even now, and this particular village does not have a regular priest and has not had for decades, they count the number of people who are there on Easter. And what you had is this precipitous decline in, uh, in the number of people going to church. So that is de-Christianization. Let me give you another example. Uh, from World War I, war memorials. Many of you have had my friend, uh, some of you may have had my friend Jay Winter's course. And he works, he's done a lot of work on war memorials. And if you go to parts of France that were very dechristianized, more about this later, if you go to the, to the Creuse or up here to the Nièvre here or the Allier, those are sort of classic examples of very dechristianized parts of France. Even the war memorials were in some places where you practiced religion. The war, the number, the, the monument to the dead will be near the church. In some of those places, the mo monument to the dead is not only not near the church that no one goes to, but will have a broken cross, asking that same question that Voltaire went to ask about the Lisbon earthquake. If there is a God, how could he or she have allowed this to happen? And even those monuments, 
are symbols of, 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 of a decline in what had been assumed by the church and indeed assumed by the state of that old time religion. But now, is this true everywhere? Well, no, not at all. And that's one of the points. And that's one of the reasons that I insist that if you don't have one, please come up and get one later, those handy little maps with the regions and the département. Because there are huge differences. And these differences were already apparent uh, in uh, the 18th century. The French Revolution was above all the Civil War, a war about religion. And if you take a map from 1789 or 1790, 90, when the priests had to either swear to the nation, to the French Revolution, or refused to swear to the revolution and to the nation. And you take that map and you put it along a map of the elections of, of May 1849, and you put that on top of a map of the election of François Mitterrand as president of France of 1981, they're almost the same, with very few changes. And one of the predictors, here I sound like a sociologist, which I am not, but one of, of the predictors of all of that is dechristianization. Because the regions of political conservatism are the regions in which that old time religion was, in which those regions were less dechristianized than other places. So, where were the dechristianized uh, regions? Where were the religious uh, areas of still intense religious practice? Just for the hell of it. Uh, Auvergne, again, Auvergne, that's a region you should, you know, you should at least you know, know something about. If you like gastronomy, you'll think of aligo, fabulous garlic with potatoes, or you'll, you'll think of uh, you know, stuffed cabbage, you'll think of all sorts of stuff. Uh, but um, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, in, in Auvergne, uh, th you still have intense religiosity. We had, uh, have friends who once owned a cafe across from the National Archives, where I spent uh, quite a lot of time in both institutions. Um, and they, uh, the wife was from the Aviron, which is way down here, Millau and all of that. Uh, and the husband is from Cantal, which is up here, oh yeah, uh, there. And they had 13 and 12 brothers and sisters respectively, born in m abject misery in the 1930s. Just misery. Classic, some of the, the babies died, but they, uh, that's a lot of children. Now, if you compare that, if you go about, if you want to drive about not even a day, you get down here near Agen, uh, the prune capital of France, and one of the rugby capitals of France. Uh, it was said and was true that if, and I mentioned this the first day, I think that if you had more, if you had a second child, in some villages you received a, a condolence card, a condolence card. Now, how different that is, and those are places that aren't, aren't very far away. Well, the lot garonne down here is extremely dechristianized, whereas Auvergne, one of the things the Catholic Church said was, no dark secrets, baby, and have lots of children, and send the younger ones into the clergy as sisters and nuns and that sort of stuff. Uh, other areas of religious practice in Alsace, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews all practice their religion very faithfully. In the north of France, particularly in the Flemish parts of the Nord, that old time religion was still practiced. In much of Normandy, the same thing, though not in big cities, less in, less in Rouen, for example, and in Brittany, uh, above all, uh, religion was practiced, as it always had been. And there were huge numbers of people going on, what they call in Brittany the pardons, which are, which are you know, religious ceremonies full of festivity as well. Now, what are the big dechristianized areas? Almost any large city. Even in the case of, of Brittany, Brest, because it had so many sailors who weren't from Brittany there. Although a lot of Bretons were sailors also. For example, in La Havre, there are lots of Bretons who live in La Havre. But anyway, that makes things more complicated than they are. Um, uh, most big cities, some exceptions, Lyon is still fairly uh, practicing a Catholic. Uh, 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 Paris, totally lost to the church. One of the things, if you, if you go to the suburbs of Paris, even the inner suburbs that were annexed in 1860, you'll see all of these extremely modest and sometimes just impossibly ugly churches that were built in the 1870s to try to reconquer the, po the working class population that had been lost in the working class suburbs to the Catholic Church. 
Sacré-Cœur, which I've already denounced because of its ar architecture, uh, uh, you know, standing on Montmartre, the butte of, butte, butte of Montmartre was there as a sign of penance because of, of the Franco-Prussian War. But the cities were basically lost to the Catholic Church with some exceptions. But so were huge regions. Uh, the Ile de France, the area around Paris here, the Ile de France, as it's called, because you can imagine it kind of vaguely as an island because of all these rivers, uh, extremely dechristianized. The Limousin around Limoges, totally dechristianized. The Southwest, absolutely. I forgot to mention that where Bernadette of Lourdes saw the Virgin Mary, that that part of the Pyrenees was still very Christianized. Provence, much of Provence, uh, very uh, dechristianized as well. Um, and as I said before, you know, the Bourbonnais, I mean, you don't have to know these regions, just know, the, you know something about the big ones. So there are big regional disparities in this, and, and the, this is background to the separation of the church and state, uh, of church and state in 1905, and to the various laws that you can read in, in Sauerwein's book, uh, the anti-clerical legislation that really starts in 1878, 1879 that will lead to expulsion of, of some of the religious orders and eventually the decoupling of church and state in 1905. Now this, to be sure, is a rather pessimistic from the point of view of the church assessment, and perhaps overly so, because there has been recent work that has described uh, in many parts of, of France and in part, parts of the Catholic Germany also, a revival of intense religiosity that has a lot to do with miracles. Now, in the Catholic Church, uh, you know, I I in bad times, sometimes miracles come along to kind of rescue the church. And the case of Bernadette of Lourdes, before this course in 1856, was one of it. I mean, Lourdes becomes one of the first tourist sites in France after Paris because these, oh, it's always young girls, by the way, always, who see the Virgin Mary. Never young boys, it's always young girls. That's interesting. Case of Marpingen in, in the Saar in, what, 1876, up here in Germany, too, comes along at a good time for the Catholic Church, or Fatima uh, in Portugal in 1917. It's always young, illiterate shepherd girls who see the Virgin Mary. And then what happens is they interview them. They bring translators to interview them, as in the case of Bernadette. What did you see? And they stick to their stories, and pretty soon they you know, the bishops are a little skeptical, and then they seize upon the moment, and this becomes, the, you know, God is telling us something, that we have sinned and the Virgin Mary is looking after us. So it, it revives, it happened also in the 1830s near Grenoble, or is it the 40s, a place called La Salette. Uh, it is sort of uh, a sort of, of classic. A and then, uh, as I said the other day, talking about the railroads, I mean, the first, and, and for many people, only railroad trip they ever took People that, you know, in the 1870s and 1880s who didn't have a lot of money is to where? To Lourdes, to get, uh, you know, to, to, if they're sick, to try to be healed or to buy holy water. I just saw something the other day that they, they had a big confrontation in an airport because they refused to let them carry holy water on the plane because it was bigger than a mini tube of toothpaste, you know, they, how they take away, you can only have little bottles instead of big bottles, and it, it would even happen on, the, you know, a, on a papal airplane or something like that. I mean, so this, we live in a very different world now. They didn't have to worry about that stuff at the time uh, of these miracles. Uh, but pilgrimages to Lourdes from every diocese in France is still something uh, that you see uh, all the time. But regional, these regional outlines remain very, very true uh, indeed. So in 1905, what happens is the church and the state get separated. That the clergy are going to be pretty much left on their own now. Uh, that uh, uh, the state has control over uh, religious buildings. Uh, and this is bad news for priests uh, and for nuns. Now, when I, I, I've, I admitted one thing when I was talking about the religious revival, and this is something that goes, very, goes back to the early, well, not the early days, but it goes back at least to the 16th century, and probably earlier if I knew, yes, earlier, earlier than that. It goes back to the medieval period. Now, the Roman Catholics' view of women had left them pretty much in a state of subordination, and that's always pretty much been uh, uh, the case. I went to a, a school that was... Uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, Jesuit school, as I said, that only, it was mostly a sports factory, and it, it only had, and that's kind of what I did, uh, and uh, it, it didn't have women. I mean, that was, 
they were just out there somewhere. And we used to like, like to go to, uh, uh, you know, be all, if you can imagine me as an, a failed altar boy, you're looking at one, but we used to like to go out to the, to the girls' school, you know, and, and help the priest with the mass and, and all that, just to have, to have a look at, at these women who we had basically never seen uh, uh, before. But one of the things that happens, uh, happened in the Catholic Church very early uh, is that every time there's a new kind of spurt of, of religious adherence and belief, is that convents, female convents, the religious orders, are one of the places, one of the only places that, that, that women, smart, uh, upwardly mobile women, can rise and have careers worthy of their intelligence and organizational skills, if you think about it. And so it's easy, looking back you know, from our secular age, and kind of dissing all these people you know, mumbling up in the mountains someplace, uh, or, or, or not speaking at all in some cases, uh, and just, you know, simply praying all the time. But what is often forgotten is for women who couldn't possibly, you know, uh, you know do, do more than simply bear children and do the best they could in those circumstances because the, stru the strictures of society didn't give them opportunity. These convents actually have an important role in their lives that is often simply forgotten. And, and, and the role of, of, of women teachers, even though many of them were barely educated, uh, you know, in very many parts of France that were still practicing, like our part of France, uh, was, uh, it was extremely important. And they had what they called, they don't call them obviously grandfather rules, but they had essentially grandmother rules, uh, a phrase they didn't use, that meant that these teachers who were female teachers who were nuns, who were allowed, were allowed to teach in the public schools until they died. And they were given that dignity to be able to stay and teach there. And their teaching was valued uh, for uh, you know, what, 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 you know, what, what they did. Uh, and so, again, one has to, you know, ha has to keep all these things in, in, in perspective. And for, for example, there's a woman, a, a friend of mine, who did a book a, very, a long time ago, which feminists just mauled. They couldn't stand it. But it's a very important book, because what she looked is at, at, at the, the sort of upper class ladies in the North, such as those people you're going to read about in Jimmy Now. So that's a nice transition, a vaguely nice transition. And that one of the things that they were able to do because of their intense religiosity was organize their own households in ways that they wanted to, with crucifixes and statues of the Virgin Mary and all this kind of stuff. And that they carved out their own separate sphere uh, and participated in their charitable activities. So from the point of view of the Catholic Church, uh, or for religiosity in general, religious practice, all the news is not bad. But indeed, most of it was. Um, and it's, you, I mean, you know, having what, said what I've said, it's easy for you to, to, if I ask you this, to say in what regions were people mad as hell about the separation of church and state and, and about the inventories that followed in 1906. You would already know the answer. Now, what were the inventories? The inventories were they sent some state inspector around who's going to say, we're going to look at all the paintings in this church and to assess their value. Now, even in very modest villages of almost no means, uh, they all had some sort of paintings, often just terrible art. Uh, but, you know, you never know. Maybe you're going to stagger into a Rubens or something like that purely by accident on the, the border of, Fl of, of, of Flanders, of Belgium. You don't know that. And so they sent around these, specter the, these, these inspectors. And in many cases, the faithful locked themselves in the church. They barricade the church. And then they have to bring soldiers in. And, and this looks kind of bad. The soldiers are camping in fields near the church. Then they have to conscript locksmiths from the towns to come and force open the lock. And in many cases, that doesn't work. So they have to bring people with huge axes. So again, from the point of view of the church, this is the martyrdom of St. Sebastian again. This is the martyrdom of ordinary people at the hands of a cruel, secularizing, centralized state working against the interests of, of ordinary religious people. Now, to be sure, the, the Catholic Church had not done itself any great favors with the papal syllabus of errors in, 19, in 1864 that said that modernity, dem liberalism, democracy, helping workers, anything was bad. And it made the church look pretty ridiculous. And also, there was a huge controversy then over a, a papal pronouncement in 1871 uh, that said that when the pope puts on a certain hat, that he is infallible. Infallible. 
Now, we don't pay attention to this now. Nobody pays attention to this now, I guess. I had completely forgotten about it. Uh, but at that time, what if the Pope puts on a certain hat and says, you will be excommunicated and burned in hell forever if you vote for a liberal or a socialist? Voila. So what's that going to do? So the church didn't do itself any favors in being provocative. But by, by 1905, 1906, the Catholic Church, in the wake of the Dreyfus Affair, more about that another time, where the Catholic Church went after Dreyfus, uh, uh, it was better that he be guilty, even if he wasn't guilty, because he was a Jew. Uh, by then, you've had this rally, ralliement, or rallying of the church to the republic as an institution. And so things should have been better when they go around and knock on the door and try to get into these churches. But they weren't and people barricade themselves into these churches. And so I got interested in this. And um, for example, in our particular village, one of the things that people told were passed down generation after generation is that the troops had been bivouacked in the field behind the new church, which had been started in 1896 to replace the old Romanesque church, uh, which is disaffected or disaffecté, whatever you call it, uh, taken out of commission right across from where we live actually, and that the church had come, I mean that the troops had come with axes and had broken down the doors of the church, and that people had gone home with pieces of the door, cherishing them as you would a piece of the true cross on which Christ was crucified. And this was handed down from generation to generation, and people talked about it as if they had been there, even folks who had, hadn't been to church in, in ages and ages. Now, I got interested in this, because I was writing a book about this place, and so I went to all the archives, of course, and I went to all the newspapers, the Catholic newspaper, and to and the very anti-clerical socialist newspaper, and I read the accounts of all the incidents in which that happened in all these other villages in this part of France in which tensions between Protestants and Catholics had always been very high because of the wars of religion in the 16th century, 17th century, and in the 18th century. And what I discovered was that the event never happened. It never happened. That there were no troops ever bivouacked outside of the church in this particular village called Balazouk. And that there was never a time that the door was bashed down by soldiers with, uh, with axes to look at the modest paintings on the walls of this poor church whose parishioners had almost nothing. The event never happened. It did not happen. But the, it nonetheless, the, the, uh, in their ima imaginaire or in their, you know, in their, the constitution of their memory, it had a place, which is that they were defending their church against these forces from the outside, rather like the case of our school, that they couldn't control. So it had a place there, even though it never happened. It could have happened. But it just didn't. It never happened. So what's the point of all that? Is that the separation of church and state was extraordinarily wrenching in areas that were not de-Christianized, though there were incidents in some of the other ones as well, and that uh, people simply got by as uh, you know, best they could, they could in uh, the church continuing uh, to draw people on Sundays and to religious holidays, and that uh, uh, in the, in, uh, which was the case in, in, in our village. Um, in in our, our village had a priest, uh, the last one who was uh, denigrated as a red-haired ladies' man by some of his, en some of his enemies. Um, he left, I think, about, we got there 20 years ago, so about four years before we were there. And as I said the other day, in the context of the schools, uh, the Catholic Church now is just a voluntary association in our particular uh, part of France like any other one. Uh, there are no more people from our village who go to that church than will turn up at, you know, ex at the, to play bingo for the, uh, for the school, far fewer uh, 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 from that point of view. But it doesn't mean that the church doesn't have some place in the collective memory of the place, even a lot of it is imaginary or some of it is imaginary. Uh, once there was a huge windstorm, as there frequently is, and uh, we always have these the rivers, uh, in fact, it was when the 22nd of September 15 years ago, the river rose so dramatically it killed about uh, 200 people, not in our part, not our particular river, but uh, across the Rhone. Um, 
when a big storm came and the statue, this rather ugly statue of the Virgin Mary, crashed to the ground and broke into a hundred pieces or a thousand pieces in the cafe that's open all year. They put up a bowl and people who are very anti-clerical always put money into the bowl to, to rebuild this church, uh, re rebuild the statue because people you know, care that this voluntary association remain and that, and that it's still, uh, in, in the Catholic Church you call them four-wheel Catholics. People still will go there for baptism, for burial, not in this order, and for marriage. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I have assisted at, uh, with my family, uh, combined uh, baptism marriage ceremonies, uh, and uh, where the, you know, the, a, a couple will marry years and years after, uh, after having children, which is pretty usual, and actually in our part of France, among many of our, uh, many of our friends, and they're still very much couples, they just never got married. Uh, in France, uh, in Paris in the 19th century, a quarter of all couples who lived together weren't actually married. It, weren't, it wasn't that they were just defying organized religion, it was that they didn't have money to, you know, to pay to have a marriage. And, and you know, if you ever read Le Samoir, at when they do get married, there's a lot of other, one of his other great novels, when they go down the Louvre, it's one of the great scenes in, uh, in French literature, uh, so far as I know. Uh, so, but the, the trouble with the Catholic Church uh, in, in, in France is, of course, there's no priests anymore. And just end with there that, that uh, something like I read in, in Libé or one of the newspapers that um, well over half of all the priests in France now are uh, uh, oh, 65 percent of them are over 60 years old, and something like 45 percent are over 70, and there are almost no religious vocations at all, even from religious areas now. So because churches do provide you know, charity still and help organize lives for very elderly people. This is very sad. Uh, and even Voltaire, who once said that, that if God didn't exist, he should be invented, he or she should be invented so that he wouldn't be cheated by his wife or his tailor, even Voltaire would have agreed uh, that the church, uh, churches still uh, in France fill some useful function. But these regional contrasts are still extraordinarily important in dechristianization, helped define uh, the evolving politics of La Belle France. Apologies again for this colossal mess about the room. Uh, we will take care of this as soon as possible, like in the next 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, have a great weekend and have fun in sections. See ya. <laughs>